I came across this video that was posted to social media a couple days ago. This happened in College Station, Texas. And what you'll see is a, you know, college cops, you know, from my own experience at the University of Central Florida, I can recall, I can recall these like Reno 911 style bicycle cops with suppressed MP5s, like busting into my fraternity house when we were just trying to drink some beers. I saw them arrest my best friend when we literally got home from the library. We were studying literally at the library. They thought he was drinking. He, they wouldn't let him take a breathalyzer. And he would have blown a 0.00. They arrested him. And later, some other cop did let him blow. And it was 0.00. They let him go. And that played sort of a role in the career that I was inspired to take. Anyways, those are, those are college police department cops. So this is, I think, what we're dealing with here. College Station, Texas, Texas A&M, I believe that is. But take a look at this, like, chip-style motorcycle cop, like, take down this bicyclist. One of the crazy things about this video is that the officer ends up tasing this guy for not obeying his commands that he's giving him when it's the officer who's apparently trying to manipulate the guy's arm in a way that it's not designed to bend. It doesn't even look like the guy's actually resisting. It just looks like the officer's fumbling around and doesn't know how you know elbows work. And then they just tase the guy. Well, this is, in my opinion, excessive force. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous the way he dumps the motorcycle, but it, it also really, it just takes a turn towards excessive force. Towards, I mean, it is excessive force, in my opinion, and I think there's a lot of case law to support that. Now, when a taser is used, that implicates a lot of case law out there on tasers, and some of this is different per circuit. There, there's there's some minor differences in the language and the case law, the federal case law on tasers. So I primarily work with the Fourth Circuit. and But even the Fourth Circuit cases talk about some of the law in the other circuits. Now, there's a really good Fourth Circuit case if you're in Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina on tasers, and it's from 2016. Well, there's a couple of them, but Estate of Armstrong versus Pinehurst, Fourth Circuit, 2016. It goes all through this stuff. There's a couple other good ones, such as Yates versus Terry, Oram versus Rephan. But they go into the fact that they, they pretty much treat tasers like very close to, to firearms. You know, it has to be a serious um, safety threat to the police officer or to some somebody else before they really use tasers. You can't just use tasers because that's one tool of apprehending somebody. 
Now, looking at the some of the case law here, and this is from the Pinehurst case that I'm talking about. Um, just just listen to this and think about you know whether whether this should have been taught at the police academy that this officer went to. And and again, we're not in Texas; this is Fourth Circuit, but very similar uh, language, and it's all governed by the the Supreme Court case of Graham versus Connor. You look at the three factors. We've gone over that a million times, but here we go. We've explained that deploying a taser is a serious use of force, that it's designed to inflict a painful and frightening blow. For these reasons, um, it may be only deployed when a police officer is confronted with an exigency, which is an emergency, that creates an immediate safety risk and that's reasonably likely to be cured by using the taser. Is that what we saw in the video? I don't think so. Um, the subject of the seizure does not create such a risk simply because he's doing something that can be characterized as resistance. So stop resisting, stop resisting, or he wasn't putting his arm behind his back, even assuming that the elbow did bend in that way or the wrist um, did bend in that way. But the subject does not create uh, this big safety risk simply because he's doing something that can be characterized as resistance technically, even when that resistance includes physically preventing the officer from manipulating his body, i.e. arm, and the way that the officer wants. The objective facts, when viewed in the light most favorable to the plaintiff in the lawsuit, uh, shows that he was neither a dangerous felon. See the video I just made on the, the fleeing felon rule. So he's not a dangerous felon. He's just some college kid on a bicycle, it looks like. Um, no serious flight risk, no immediate threat to the officer's safety or to anyone else's safety. And thus, that would establish that the use of a taser constituted excessive force in violation of the guy's Fourth Amendment rights. That's from Yates versus Terry, Fourth Circuit 2016. Um, some other you know, really, really important taser case law out there that I've kept track of through the years here we go. Force that imposes serious consequences requiring certain, oh God, this is a hard one, significant circumscription. Force that imposes serious consequences requires significant circumscription. Yeah, try teaching that at the police academy. Our precedent consequently makes clear that tasers are proportional force only when deployed in response to a situation in which a reasonable officer would perceive some immediate danger that can be mitigated by using the taser. It's excessive and unreasonable use of force for a police officer repeatedly to administer electric shocks with a taser on an individual who no longer is armed or who has been brought to the ground, has been restrained physically by several other officers, and who's no longer actively resisting arrest. And that's sort of what we had here. He was brought to the ground by, by Officer Chips, and then we had another officer come, and so he wasn't going anywhere. They had him. They were just trying to get his arm behind his back so they could handcuff him, but they were doing it incorrectly. And then boom, they just tased him. But it wasn't a safety threat, doesn't appear to be on the video. And there's two officers there and not a fleeing felon sort of situation. Immediate danger is the key to the court's distinction. Tasing an arrestee ceased being a, a proportional use of force when the officer continued to use his taser after the arrestee did not pose a continuing threat to the officer's safety. Um, the court also said we've previously held that tasing suspects after they've been secured in response to minimal nonviolent resistance constitutes excessive force. Now that's the Pinehurst case that I talked about from the Fourth Circuit. Um, one last thing doesn't rule out the possibility that taser use could be justified in some situations where an arrestee's noncompliance could be described as nonviolent. Such a situation would require the existence of facts from which an officer could reasonably conclude that the resistance presents some immediate danger despite its nonviolent character. And that's actually a Tenth Circuit case from 2007, Casey versus City of Federal Heights. So the key to all of these cases is there has to be some substantial safety threat, not necessarily that justifies firearms or the use of deadly force clearly is excessive force that's caught in this video. If this had happened in West Virginia, hell, I'd, I'd want to file suit tomorrow. That, that should be a good case. I don't know what it was that they were after with the kid, but I'm sure it's very, very, very minor or else we would have already heard about it. And then, 
you know, so just the way they took him down, the taser, um, the fact that it's caught on video, and I think it's going to get a reaction from a jury at some point, that's going to be a case that they want to settle. Just my opinion, obviously.